webinar is part of the California Institute for Behavioral Health Solutions Continuous Care Reform Technical Assistance. This project is funded through a contract with the Department of Health Care Services. Today's webinar is the first of a three-part series of webinars on trauma-informed care. Today's focus is why trauma-informed care. Before we begin today's presentation, we have a polling question we would like you to answer. This will help us get a better understanding of our audience today. Please tell us where you work. Are you state or county child welfare, state or county behavioral or mental health, a contract agency or CBO providing services, probation, or others. So we'll wait a few minutes while, you're, while you, while you um, do the poll. Select one. Okay, we're going to close the poll now. Thanks for participating. And we have 18% um, of child welfare, state and county, 16% behavioral health, state and county, 33% of our audience is CBO, contract agencies providing services, 1% of probation, glad you guys are out there, and 32% other. Great, thank you so much. Today's presenter is Kristen Dempsey. Kristen is a senior associate here with CIBHS and has over 20 years of clinical experience providing therapy for adults, children, youth, and families. She has participated in the neurosequential model of therapeutics training with Dr. Bruce Perry at the Child Trauma Academy and has helped develop trauma-informed behavioral health systems of care in California. Kristen is currently completing research on supported education models to support foster youth college completion. In addition to her interest in trauma treatment, Kristen leads training in motivational interviewing, applied suicide intervention skills, and treatment of co-occurring disorders. I'm now going to turn the presentation over to, Crim to Kristen. All right. Thank you very much, Kim and Kelly, and thank you all for joining us uh, today during your, your lunch time uh, for this uh, webinar. We're actually going to do another uh, poll, and another piece I'd like to add before we get started is this series, it's, it's a definitely introductory series, and I know a lot of folks come to training with a lot of trauma experience and understanding already, uh, and just being aware that this is, in fact, an introductory training, so some of these concepts may be familiar. I do, however, try to bring in newer research and maybe some new ideas and, and materials that people have not seen before. So I certainly hope um, you, you enjoy this and are able to find something new if you've already seen a number of webinars or trainings. Uh, one thing we'd like to start off with is just a little poll here on a little bit about trauma-informed care. So, which is true, pick the best answer. Clearly, there's always this, that piece around uh, multiple choice. Involves everyone in the system. It's often hard to, pro uh, to provide because of expense. Requires specialized training. Or the last response is for people who have been in the most, who have been the most impacted by trauma in our communities. And the poll is in progress. We'll close the poll. Thank you for participating. And 80% of our audience has picked the first one, involves everyone in a system of care. 1% uh, is often hard to provide because of expense. And 10% requires specialized training. And 8% of the audience says, is for people who have been the most impacted by trauma in our community. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. 
And this is something that we are really trying to think about when we think of trauma-informed care, is that really it does in fact involve everybody in a system of care, which was the correct answer, which is A. And what we mean by that is that everybody providing services has a role to play in terms of being trauma-informed and being aware of trauma as a lens of understanding uh, the people that we, that we serve and understanding how people might experience trauma. And hopefully this webinar will really address that. One thing I would like to say in response to some of the other questions is that so many people actually are exposed to various aspects of trauma. We really don't want to think of trauma services uh, in, in general for only a very small segment of folks. And also, we can, of course, spend a lot of money on a lot of things, but really trauma-informed care actually, taking this frame and having this understanding, uh, is not expensive at all. In fact, you're, you're doing a lot today to go ahead and get that particular point of view established as you attend this webinar. Okay, so let's start off with this idea of what, what is trauma anyway? And of course, there's a number of definitions that are floating around out there. I did take a SAMHSA's uh, definition, and one of the reasons I thought this definition was particularly useful is one, SAMHSA's providing a lot of leadership around trauma-informed care, and in fact, there is tip 57, which is at the back of this webinar, which I recommend on trauma-informed care that SAMHSA published. And they brought together a number of, of leaders in terms of research to really think about this. But this particular definition has also uh, been created through community. So some of you may have been around in 2010 when SAMHSA asked for providers and consumers and family members uh, to think about what is trauma. And they came with this, this set of uh, definitions. According to SAMHSA, Trauma and Justice Strategic Initiative, trauma results from an event, series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. So a number of different aspects of people's lives, as well as uh, people's you know, physical as well as emotional and physical um, well-being is really threatened. And another piece um, that's here, you know, think about what is trauma. It's also used to describe um, experiences and situations that are emotionally painful, distressing, overwhelm people's ability to cope, and leave them powerless. And I like Judith Herman's idea around in trauma result events are extraordinary, not because they occur rarely, but rather because they overwhelm the ordinary human adaptations to life. So here's the, the pieces that we really want to think about is that most of us just by walking this earth will have some exposure, exposure to tra trauma on some level. But what we're really thinking about is are we overwhelmed? Do we feel powerless? Is our ability to cope seriously impacted by what could potentially be a traumatic experience? Because it varies for different people. And that's where we can experience the trauma, is that overwhelm or that powerlessness. So we have a list here of, like, of you know, some common signs of trauma. This is not an exhaustive list, but it, it's a common list, potentially. And I also have the links where I find some of this material. The links are at the back of this uh, PowerPoint. But these are some common signs and things that we can often see and things that we often see in our children and families. And this idea, if you look through of each of these bullets, often these will be connected to fight, flight, or numbing or dissociative responses. That when any of us are traumatized, we often you know, go back to a more primitive part of our mind and it becomes a lot about survival. So you'll find people being really hyper-aroused, like being very sensitive, being on edge, um, being watchful and anxious. You see some of these ideas here. But you also find people trying to escape, trying to get out of place, uh, get, getting out of situations, avoidance for sure, or also just numbing out, feeling numb, not remembering periods of one's life, um, maybe even finding oneself repeatedly in situations where abuse um, can occur even though you may have experienced that a number of times, there's a certain amount of numbing potentially that can allow somebody to, to, to end up in situations above and beyond um, where they may just be stuck and have no choice. And next slide, please. Um, so why should we care about trauma? I actually have a series of slides here, uh, which I won't spend a lot of time on just because of time, but 
I think it's important to really look at the prevalence. Um, and I'm thinking too about you know, what we're doing in terms of working with children is we're really trying to prevent ongoing trauma. And looking at these bullets, 60% of adults report experiencing abuse or other difficulty in family circumstances during childhood. That's over half of us. And a quarter of the children, over a quarter of the children, will witness or experience a traumatic event before they turn four. So very, very young people are experiencing trauma. Next. And so this is something I feel like to think about just in terms of, of you know, trauma and trauma-informed care and this idea of this prevalence, which I'll get back to in a second, is when we're thinking about some of these ideas of, of trauma, we're really thinking about not so much about what's wrong with somebody, but what happened to you. So it's a real sh shift in the frame and it really helps us think more about wellness and recovery and this idea of, you know, people have symptoms, people have behaviors. That makes sense when you think about the fact that they experience trauma, especially if we think about experiencing trauma when someone is very young. Um, so in fact, some things that we see as trauma symptoms and, and problems, if we think about it in terms of what actually happened to somebody, it's not that we go and we spend a lot of time in somebody's past history, but if we think about what was the cause of this, then we can often see that often behaviors can actually, at least at one point, serve a certain function or adaptational role. Now often people are troubled by uh, these particular symptoms or issues that have developed, but it helps us become less pathologizing and more recovery oriented. And recently too, you may hear people say things, it's not about what's wrong with you, it's you know, it's about what happened to you, and it's also about what's strong with you now for thinking about um, kind of next steps, about building resiliency and, and uh, uh, skills in people who have been, who are survivors of trauma. So a little more, um, I have a couple more slides here about prevalence, and some of these, these slides are fairly recent research results that have come out in longitudinal over time. You think would be tracking and, and you know, there's, there's, of course, all these different databases, right? You're trying to figure out kind of trends. You'll just notice, um, you know, that, that trends between 88 and 89 have actually went down, some of the, the trends around uh, child maltreatment, and now they kind of leveled off, um, but are still fairly high over, you know, the last uh, decade or so. So in 2014, there were approximately 702,000 maltreated children in the United States. It's about a rate of 9.4 per Per hundred per thousand. So these data reflect, you know, kind of state's definition of what maltreatment is. But I think what we're really kind of looking at is obviously we've got some concerns out there, and let's break this down a little bit more. Even next slide is just who's actually in this report. And I think when you look at this slide, you know, one of the things that really stands out is that young children are more likely than older children to be victims of child maltreatment. And so it's something we really want to be thinking about in our work. Uh, children three and younger had child maltreatment rate of 14.8 per thousand compared with 10.6 per, per thousand for children ages four to seven. And then, of course, you can see it goes down as, as youth get older. Right. Another thing that we see in the data is we see that uh, children of color are also um, disproportionately represented. Uh, this also being a concern for many communities, clearly. And in 2014, African American children had a reported maltreatment rate of 15.3 per thousand. American Indian and Alaska Native children had a reported maltreatment rate of 13.4. And children of multiple races had a rate of 10.6 per thousand. This compares with 8.8 .8 for Hispanic children, um, and 8.6 for Pacific Islander children, and 8.4 for white children, and 1.7 for Asian children. Just kind of important, again, to think about what community are you working in, who are the children that you're working with, and, you know, might they be experiencing even more trauma and more trauma at younger ages than you might think. So this is kind of an important article from uh, JAMA Pediatrics that came out in 2014, really looking at um, these yeah, annual reports and really recognize that there's some un understatement of the cumulative number of children maltreated during childhood. So these numbers are really astounding. So we have 1.1 1 .1 in 8 children maltreated by the age of 18. Um, for instance, um, and again, I won't go, go through each and every bullet point. You can certainly read them. 
But I think, you know, what's clearly important here is that, you know, the, the burden of confirmed maltreatment is far greater than suggested by any single year uh, estimate. And that if they go over time, they really start to see that, um, you know, in excess for in, in over a number of years, there's a number of groups that have, you know, in excess of over 25% maltreatment in certain communities. And this is clearly really important for informing public health efforts, monitoring, and policy, in addition to our various interventions. Another thing I'd like to say about this is, as we kind of move on and really start to think, we'll go to the next slide, is not necessarily that we're going to, you know, be completely uh, kind of hyper, hyper vigilant and start to assign maltreatment where it's not existing, but just it gives us an idea of trauma and people's experience of trauma should be an expectation and not an exception. And what that means is that, again, with, without, you know, obviously creating false reports, that we at least ask and that we at least follow up and we do some screening of all children because the prevalence is so high and so many communities are at risk. It's really so important to be, you know, curious and thoughtful and, you know, just very aware that we have a number of folks out there who um, would really benefit from kind of further screening and um, addressing the trauma issue. Another piece, we're going to kind of move on here a little bit. Um, again, just in terms of well, what's actually you know, happening when people are traumatized, clearly this is not an exhaustive list. And some are more uh, common in childhood than others. We also want to look at this and be able to think about the fact that trauma to some degree is subjective, uh, although I think clearly on this list, the pieces that we have here, the examples that we have, would more than likely be considered you know, traumatizing for, for the average person. But I have some things on here like, say, grief and medical procedures where clearly depending on um, you know, relationships that we may have or supports that we might have or you know, the nature of certain procedures, you know, be more or less traumatizing. Whereas clearly things like terrorism and war, <clears throat> sexual assault, I mean, most of the, those, these things clearly are, are traumatizing for most, most everyone. And then with our next slide, you'll see another piece of way we understand, and hopefully this will be clear enough on your visual, and it's a little bit hard to read in the PowerPoint, but this is also from tip 57. And so we talked about, on the previous slide, about all these different types of potential uh, root causes or, or causes of trauma. And it's important to think about, and I like this slide because it gives us a sense that trauma comes in many forms. It can be internal, external, community, all these different places. But I like how this particular slide really breaks down, uh, you know, all the different levels. You know, there's, there's the individual response. I talked about things being subjective. But then there's interpersonal. There are different supports and in, in who we have around us who might be able to help support us during a particular trauma. Um, the community and organizational. If I live in a community that is uh, everybody's traumatized already, that adds another layer of, of trauma or lack of support that I might be experiencing. Um, again, also organizational. If we don't have good organizational supports, maybe our or schools are not functioning the way they should be, maybe don't have access to various um, health care or case management, for instance. There's societal issues, and of course, we're faced with that every day, right, about various, um, you know, clearly addressing large amounts of stigma, but also how we make choices about how we spend money and support children and families in health care, for instance. And then there's our time in history. Um, there's times in history where we have more technology, uh, we have more, um, maybe more war, you know, more, more things that, that come up that actually potentially could be traumatizing or could help mitigate trauma as well. And then you'll see that the arrow is pointing out that there's the types and characteristics of trauma that create certain dimensions. And then there's also just developmental cultural influences. How old are you when this occurs to you? Um, how does your culture manage particular events? Okay, so um, hopefully that was kind of enough of a little introduction there about the different types of trauma and how they might show up and the prevalence. I had talked about this idea of really thinking about trauma as being the expectation and not the exception, and this kind of leads us into a little study around ACE. So in regard to trauma, we got another pop quiz. Um, 
ACE refers to someone who has worked through their trauma, or B stands for adverse childhood experiences. See what you want to get at the blackjack table if you have a king, not like I'm a card shark or anything. And D, someone who's really good at getting people to talk about their trauma. Half people, half people, okay. We'll give you another couple seconds. All right, I think we're good right. to go. Yeah. Okay, Kristen. Well, ninety-eight percent of the audience <laughs> picked B, stands okay. for adverse childhood experiences. Okay. And and then we just had one or two people that picked A, and someone picked D. I think they were. Okay. All right. All right. Um, thank you very much. So we had 98% of you. You're a very smart crew and very well-informed crew. Um, and we'll go to the next slide and talk about the adverse childhood experiences. And this graphic, you've probably seen this around. This is such an important graphic because what we're talking about in terms of, of ACEs um, and adverse childhood experiences is really we're looking at how we're rethinking trauma to become a public health issue and why, again, it's so important is becoming foundational to have experience, understanding, awareness around trauma. And some of you may be familiar with how the ACE study came to be with Dr. Vincent Folletti, uh, who was at Kaiser San Diego, who became very curious about people with uh, weight issues were, were challenged when, you know, all things considered, um, were really struggling with weight loss and that he was regime, um, treatments that he was providing, and he started to become really curious about what other factors could be going on. There's something else that's really getting in the way of people to kind of follow through. And he did use large studies that have been occurring now over 20 years. And since 1997, over 17,000 individuals have been followed in his study, which he very widely partnered with the uh, Centers for Disease Control to carry out the study. And what they learned is that there's a number of adverse childhood experiences that they were actually asking about. And that they noticed that when people were exposed to these ACEs, we all know what ACEs are now, that it resulted in health issues of all kinds later on in life. So if people have adverse childhood experiences, and you're going to see the ACE quiz in the next two slides, but we won't get to that yet. People have adverse childhood experiences that then create social, emotional, and cognitive impairments. Again, that idea I talked about before, that people then adapt you know, certain ways of dealing with these impairments that result um, as, as, because of trauma. And then those um, high-risk behaviors, even though they were a way of potentially dealing with or coping, obviously, usually quite unconsciously, with the trauma, will then often lead to disease, disability, and social problems. And of course, the sad outcome of that is, is early death. And they started to really study this relationship between ACEs, the number of early traumas you had, and then this idea of like the, the behaviors and the early death and disease piece. And they really started to see you know, quite a strong correlation to the extent that a number of you know, ACE studies are continuing all the time. In fact, I, I have on here acestudy.org. You can go and find out where there's been ACE connections. But so far, it's been alcoholism and and alcohol abuse, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, depression, fetal death, uh, illicit drug use, heart disease, liver disease, um, risk for intimate partner violence, uh, smoking, obesity, suicide attempts, among others. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. We're actually going to see a little video here. It's, um, it's a TED Talk, and some of you may have seen this. But this um, is a talk of Dr. Nadine Burke, who is a, a become very well known after a New Yorker uh, expose uh, in a, in about seven years ago, who is a, a pediatrician in San Francisco. And she started to become curious in a similar way that Dr. Folletti did with all these children that she was seeing in this neighborhood who were coming in with these subclinical presentations of, of things and a lot of times, you know, various behavioral problems or, you know, physical things that couldn't quite, you know, meet, um, you know, certain clinical um, 
guidelines, so to speak. And she's like, well, or, or they did. And she was wondering, why are all these patterns? And she became really curious about the types of trauma that children are exposed to. And she also started to see this pattern between early childhood trauma exposure and the development. In this case, they weren't adults. They were, they were children. Started to see the actual connections. So we're going to go ahead and actually show you this video. It's about 16 minutes long. Let's give you Just go ahead in a second. Yeah. As we're getting started here, you know, what I might do is actually talk a little more about the ACEs. You're going to see, like I said, the, as we're getting this rolled up, there's 10 ACE study questions over the next three slides, which we'll, we'll get to in a minute. But just to give you a sense of that, so when we get to them, we won't have to spend a lot of time going to each of the slides. The actual 10 topics are, you know, did parents or other adults in the household ever swear at you, insult you, put you down, humiliate you, act in a way that made you feel afraid or physically hurt? Um, did you ever, number two, was you ever grab, slap, throw something at you, ever hit you so hard that you had marks? Um, were you ever um, touched or in a sexual way, or did anybody try to actually have anal, oral, or vaginal sex with you? Did you feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special? Family didn't look out for each other? And as I'm going through these, I mean, these are all like pretty intense situations to be sure. Did you often feel that you don't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, had no one to protect you, your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you, bring you to the doctor? Number six, were your parents ever separated or divorced? Number seven, was your mother or stepmother often pushed, grabbed, slapped, ever had something thrown at her, sometimes kicked, beaten, or hissed, hit with a fist? So the domestic violence or intimate partner violence is also a question on the ACE. Uh, another, number eight, did you live with anyone who's a problem drinker, alcoholic, or who used street drugs? Or number nine, was a household member depressed or mentally ill, or did a household member attempt suicide? And the final question is, did a household member go to prison? And this is a pretty simple little questionnaire it's in terms of construction. It's just the 10 questions there. And then how actually score people give themselves one point for each, each of the uh, questions. And then um, you know, at the end, you know, this, there can be some correlations between with with certain amount of um, with, sorry we're getting we're getting, we're getting the the, uh, the video started so I'll get back to that in a minute but before then um, now you have a little background what the ACE is you'll be able to hear what uh, Dr Nadine Burke Harris found out um, about ACEs in her own work. discovered an exposure that dramatically increased the risk for 7 out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the United States. In high doses, it affects brain development, the immune system, hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. Folks who are exposed in very high doses have triple the lifetime risk of heart disease and lung cancer and a 20-year difference in life expectancy. And yet doctors today are not trained in routine screening or treatment. Now, the exposure I'm talking about is not a pesticide or pathogen chemical. It's childhood trauma. OK, what kind of trauma am I talking about here? I'm not talking about failing a test 
or losing a basketball game. I am talking about threats that are so severe or pervasive that they literally get under our skin and change our physiology. Things like abuse or neglect, or growing up with a parent who struggled with mental illness or substance abuse. Now, for a long time, I view these things in the way I was trained to view them, either as a social problem, referred to social services, or as a mental health problem, referred to mental health services. And then something happens to make me rethink my entire approach. When I finished my residency, I wanted to go to a place where I felt really needed, some place where I could make a difference. So I came to work for California Pacific Medical Center, one of the best private hospitals in Northern California. And together, we opened a clinic in Bayview Hunters Point, one of the poorest, most underserved neighborhoods in San Francisco. Now, prior to that point, there had been only one pediatrician in all of Bayview to serve more than 10,000 children. So we hung a shingle, and we were able to provide top quality care regardless of ability to pay. It was so cool. We targeted the typical health disparities, access to care, immunization rates, asthma hospitalization rates, and we hit all of our numbers. We felt very proud of ourselves. But then I started noticing a disturbing trend. A lot of kids were being referred to me for ADHD, or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But when I actually did a thorough history of physical, what I found was that for most of my patients, I couldn't make a diagnosis of ADHD. Most of the kids I was seeing had experienced such severe trauma that it felt like something else was going on. Somehow, I was missing something important. Now, before I did my residency, I did a master's degree in public health. And one of the things that they teach you in public health school is that if you're a doctor, and you see 100 kids that all drink from the same well, and 98 of them develop diarrhea, you can go ahead and write that prescription for dose after dose after dose of antibiotics, or you can walk over and say, what the hell is in this well? So I began reading everything that I could get my hands on about how exposure to adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. And then one day, my colleague walked into my office and he said, Dr. Burke, have you seen this? In his hand was a copy of a research study called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. That day changed my clinical practice and ultimately my career. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study is something that everybody needs to know about. It was done by Dr. Vince Felitti at Kaiser and Dr. Bob Onda at the CDC. And together, they asked 17,500 adults about their history of exposure to what they called adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. Those include physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, parental mental illness, substance dependence, incarceration, parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. For every yes, you would get a point on your ACE score. And then what they did was they correlated these ACE scores against health outcomes. What they found was striking. Two things. Number one, ACEs are incredibly common. 67% of the population had at least one ACE, and 12.6%, one in eight, had four or more ACEs. The second thing that they found was that there was a dose-response relationship between ACEs and health outcomes. The higher your ACE score, the worse your health outcomes. For a person with an ACE score of four or more, their relative risk of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease was two and a half times that of someone with an ACE score of zero. For hepatitis, it was also two and a half times. For depression, it was four and a half times. 
For suicidality, it was 12 times. A person with an ACE score of seven or more had triple the lifetime risk of lung cancer and three and a half times the risk of ischemic heart disease, the number one killer in the United States of America. Well, of course, this makes sense. You know, some people look at this data and they said, come on. You have a rough childhood, you're more likely to drink and smoke and do all these things that are going to ruin your health. This isn't science. This is just bad behavior. It turns out this is exactly where the science comes in. We now understand, better than we ever have before, how exposure to early adversity affects the developing brains and bodies of children. It affects areas like the nucleus accumbens the pleasure and reward center of the brain that is implicated in substance abuse. It inhibits the prefrontal cortex, which is necessary for impulse control and executive function, a critical area for learning. And on MRI scans, we see measurable differences in the amygdala, the brain's fear response center. So there are real neurologic reasons why folks exposed to high doses of adversity are more likely to engage in high-risk behavior. And that's important to know. But it turns out that even if you don't engage in any high-risk behavior, you're still more likely to develop heart disease or cancer. The reason for this has to do with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the brain and body stress response system that governs our fight or flight response. How does it work? Well, imagine you're walking in the forest and you see a bear. Immediately, your hypothalamus sends a signal to your pituitary, which sends a signal to your adrenal gland that says, release stress hormone, adrenaline, cortisol. And so your heart starts to pound, your pupils dilate, your airways open up, and you are ready to either fight that bear or run from the bear. And that is wonderful. If you're in a forest and there's a bear. But the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night. And this system is activated over and over and over again. And it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health-damaging. Children are especially sensitive to this repeated stress activation because their brains and bodies are just developing. High doses of adversity not only affect brain structure and function, they affect the developing immune system, developing hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. So for me, this information threw my old training out the window because when we understand the mechanism of a disease, when we know not only which pathways are disrupted, but how, then as doctors, it is our job to use this science for prevention and treatment. That's what we do. So in San Francisco, we created a Center for Youth Wellness to prevent, screen, and heal the impacts of ACEs and toxic stress. We started simply with routine screening of every one of our kids at their regular signal call. Because I know that if my patient has an ACE score of four, she's two and a half times as likely to develop hepatitis or COPD. She's four and a half times as likely to become depressed, and she's 12 times as likely to attempt to take her own life as my patient with zero ACEs. I know that when she's in my exam room. For our patients who do screen positive, we have a multidisciplinary treatment team that works to reduce the growth of adversity and treat symptoms using best practices, including home visits, care coordination, mental health care, nutrition, holistic interventions, and yes, medication when necessary. But we also educate parents about the impact of ACEs and toxic stress the same way you would for covering electrical outlets or lead poisoning. And we tailor the care of our asthmatics and our diabetics 
in a way that recognizes that they may need more aggressive treatment given the changes to their hormonal and immune system. So the other thing that happens when you understand this science is that you'll want to shout it from the rooftop because this isn't just an issue for kids in Bayview. I figured the minute that everybody else heard about this, it would be routine screening, your multidisciplinary treatment teams, and it would be a race to the most effective clinical treatment protocol. Yes, that did not happen. And that was a huge learning for me. What I had thought of as simply best clinical practice, I now understand to be a movement. In the words of Dr. Robert Block, the former president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, adverse childhood experiences are the single greatest unaddressed public health threat facing our nation today. And for a lot of people, that's a terrifying prospect. The scope and scale of the problem seems so large that it feels overwhelming to think about how we might approach it. But for me, that's actually where the hope lies. Because when we have the right framework, when we recognize this to be a public health crisis, then we can begin to use the right toolkit to come up with solutions. From tobacco to lead poisoning to HIV AIDS, the United States actually has quite a strong track record with addressing public health problems. But replicating those successes with ACEs and toxic stress is going to take determination and commitment. And when I look at what our nation's response has been so far, I wonder, why haven't we taken this more seriously? You know, at first, I thought that we marginalized the issue because it doesn't apply to us, right? That's an issue for those kids in those neighborhoods, which is weird because the data doesn't bear that out. The original ACEs study was done in a population that was 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated. But then, the more I talk to folks, I'm beginning to think that maybe I had it completely backwards. If I were to ask how many people in this room grew up with a family member who suffered from mental illness, I bet a few hands would go up. And then if I were to ask how many folks had a parent who maybe drank too much or who really believed that if you spare the rod, you spoil the child, I bet a few more hands would go up. Even in this room, this is an issue that touches many of us. And I'm beginning to believe that we marginalize the issue because it does apply to us. Maybe it's easier to see in other zip codes because we don't want to look at it. We'd rather be sick. Fortunately, scientific advances and frankly, economic realities make that option less viable every day. The science is clear. Early adversity dramatically affects health across the lifetime. Today we are beginning to understand how to interrupt the progression from early adversity to disease and early death. And 30 years from now, the child who has a high ACE score and whose behavioral symptoms go unrecognized, whose asthma management is not connected and who goes on to develop high blood pressure and early heart disease or cancer will be just as anomalous as a six-month mortality from HIV AIDS. People will look at that situation and say, what the heck happened there? This is treatable. This is beatable. The single most important thing that we need today is the courage to look this problem in the face and say, this is real, and this is all of us. I believe that we are the movement. Thank you. Thank you.
actually probably have a little bit of time at the end of our discussion here to um, entertain any questions or thoughts about Dr. Berkshire's presentation. But you'll notice, and we'll get to these in a second once we switch out of our, our video, that I've actually included the ACE survey that I read off earlier while we're loading up in the uh, PowerPoint slides. You can, here we go, um, you can actually, and we'll go ahead and go to the next two slides so you can see them. You can actually add up, as I said before, the, the individual points and see what your ACE score is. We actually had a poll embedded in this particular presentation where we were going to poll people about the ACE score. We're going to actually skip over that just in, in favor of other um, content and also be able to have more time for questions. But you might want to do that for yourself. I mean, I just, I'm thinking of, of her last words there. It's just, you know, that part of what makes this a really challenging issue is that, um, you know, trauma doesn't discriminate. And for many of us, we have also been traumatized in various ways. And I'll do this sometimes in some of the classes I teach, um, some of the graduate courses I actually have my students take anonymously uh, to the extent that they feel comfortable. Obviously, it can be really, really triggering. So having people take care of themselves and I encourage that for all of you as well. You know, please don't feel like you have to do this if it's something you're very uncomfortable with. But people really learn about uh, how, you know, this trauma, these issues are kind of all of us. You know, we're all kind of in this culture and stew together if you think about the earlier slides. And that, you know, how does our trauma, our history of trauma, how might it impact our willingness to work with trauma? How does it impact our own resiliency uh, our own self-care, uh, and our own overall health. Um, but I do believe she makes a, a great argument, as you know, of course Dr. Folletti and Dr. Anda from the CDC, about ACEs being um, a public health issue. At the back of this PowerPoint slide, I have two really important websites, maybe more than that, for the ACE study. And one is acestudy.org, but there's also ACEs Connection and ACEs Too High. And basically these websites are just clearing houses of information in terms of policy, research, you know, various um, you know, experiments that people have done exploring ACEs in their community and successful uh, protocol people have put into place to help reduce ACEs. And I think it's a great place to go if you're really serious about looking at some of the more organizational or larger issues around um, adverse childhood experiences. But now for the rest of our time, I'd like to shift gears a little bit into uh, kind of more the micro level, uh, in terms of individual level, I should say, of brain development and trauma. To spend a little time here, I don't go into a lot of detail about brain development and trauma here, uh, but I go into just some, some basic pieces I think that are important. I knew we wouldn't have time for me to go into a lot of detail. But I wanted to start to set the stage for how we think about intervening with children and, and families uh, in our, in our work. And so again, there's, there's systemic, there's, there's programs and policies, but many of you are also working, of course, individually with families uh, or with you know, individual uh, children as well. And thinking about how to best kind of intervene and approach and the best interventions to use. We have, we'll go to the next slide for our poll, another poll, um, you know, which is untrue. And again, this is more about the best answer. It's not like these are, um, you know, always, true at every single moment, but let's think about the, which ones are untrue. Uh, uh, oh, okay. You know, oh, no, okay, sorry, that poll does not, does not happen. But you can think about this, just to let you know if you saw that particular slide or you see that slide um, as you open up your PowerPoint. You'll actually, the, the correct, correct answer is that, to that is the younger the child is, the more vulnerable the brain is to the effects of trauma. And that leads into our discussion about the human brain. Part of what is so, you know, uh, certainly challenging about trauma uh, is the impact it has on the brain very early in life. And so we know that people are exposed to trauma while the brain is developing. It has an impact on how the brain develops. And something that we've been learning and we've been discussing and a number of you know, organizations have been kind of addressing this in terms of their intervention and their practices. But just to give you a little orientation around this, the human brain is organized from the bottom up with the most simple, very important functions and concentration of neurons at the base of the brain stem to the most complex at the top of the cortex. And 
as, as we develop then, you know, we're obviously we're developing from the bottom up. But an interesting piece, we think about this, um, and we'll talk about this in a minute, we go to the next slide. We actually are bringing kind of the function of our brain and our ability to regulate is kind of top down. So here's the interesting thing that, that we've found is that if children have had significant developmental trauma, there'll be a, a high likelihood of poor organization and functioning in the lower parts of the brain, including the brain stem, the, the diencephalon, um, and, and as a result of a reaction to the stress response system. And when that happens, when there's that disruption lower down the brain, it makes it very hard for uh, kind of higher parts of the brain to really um, you know, get online and to properly function and be able to do the learning functions and emotional regulation, the sensory integration, the relational development in ways that we would consider developmentally appropriate. So just to give you an idea, I'll just kind of give you some, some ideas. For instance, the brainstem controls basic survival functions such as heart rate, breathing, sleeping, digesting food, and maintaining consciousness. But you know, actually, I'm going to go back to the last back slide so you can actually see the brain again. I'm sorry, I should have went ahead a little further there. There we go. Yeah, there we go. So you look down at the spinal cord. That's that's going to brain stem, and then the cerebellum, which you're, you're seeing like right behind that. Yeah, there you go. Thank you for highlighting that. That works with balance, coordination, attention, rhythm, skilled movements, and help helps build learning pathways. And then as we get on the top, you know, more of the cortex. And there's different levels of the cortex, but just kind of more globally and generally. Uh, it's the largest brain structure, and it's responsible for our, our child's personality, thinking, motor skills, reasoning, and sensory, inter, uh, sensory input. Of course, there's four lobes that are divided into all that. And so what's important here is if we have some disruption that occurs because of trauma lower down, then again, higher up will also be, there will be a struggle to um, develop those particular uh, capacities. So we may see situations where we will have children in schools, and we can even see this sometimes, where they can hear that people are having problems with learning, retention, the academics, maybe the more higher level of cognitive capacity, all the learning pieces. And we may want to you know, apply certain um, kind of interventions to really address the executive functioning. But if it started with the, the trouble was kind of earlier on the brainstem, and we often will notice that if we notice that kids are having a hard time with sensory integration, maybe they're having really disruptive relationships because it's kind of more kind of their, their limbic system. Um, maybe they also um, are having um, you know problems with uh, self-regulation. Again, that's a little bit lower down the brainstem. We have to deal with those issues before we can actually get kids you know kind of more academically. Um, prepared and functioning, so to speak. So again, I think the point I'm really trying to bring up here is that we have different interventions that we need to apply depending on where the disruption might be in terms of uh, the structure of the brain. And I apologize, there's one section I forgot, and that's of course our limbic system. Sorry, I don't know how I possibly forgot the limbic system, maybe because I thought I discussed it earlier, but that includes the, the midbrain, and it includes um, if you look at the, yeah, it's got the midbrain there, we talk about the amygdala, hippocampus, thalamus, hypothalamus, basal ganglia, uh, among other areas. This includes our, our emotions, reactions, and even creating our memory pathways. So that's where we see when kids or any of us kind of get connected with our fight or flight or fear responses as trauma is um, re-triggered. That's, that's where we're functioning from. We're fu functioning from our limbic system. So thinking again as a review, down to the very the brainstem, the cerebellum, the limbic system, and the cortex, these are kind of the four main areas. And that challenges in development in the lower areas of the brain because of trauma is going to impact um, the, the higher levels of functioning. So I'm going to go ahead and move on, Nikki Kelly, for going back to that, to the next slide, and then the next slide. This is the slide of the full guy. So how we may experience the traumatized brain. So this is really important because, you know, again, for years, I'm thinking again of what Dr. Um, Burke Harris was saying, you, we have, we've often been trained in school in terms of certain behaviors. Uh, maybe we're seeing a kid who uh, seems bright and are capable, but their, their behavior is confounding. And they're, um, you know, they're often distressed. They, you know, the, the fluorescent, the buzzing of the fluorescent light in the classroom drives them, you know, berserk. You know, it seems really unreasonable. 
uh, or you know, they're, um, if a if teacher or anybody kind of raises their voice to them, they get really agitated. And we may see kids kind of go into these places of being dissociative or really super anxious or highly aroused or um, agitated, acting out conduct problems. And so clearly there can be a number of causes. But again, thinking of the prevalence of child maltreatment, thinking of the prevalence of trauma, it's a really important piece to be thinking now that we're really becoming aware as we develop a more understanding of brain science. Again, we have what's wrong with the kid. You know, they, they can't stay on the fluorescent lights and they don't want to keep their shoes on or whatever thing might be going on. They're fighting with other kids. But also be curious about that's what's wrong, but what could have happened? Starting to really kind of understand that did this, this child have a certain amount of maltreatment? When did that maltreatment occur? And who uh, were, were they involved with? And how often did it occur? And what other kinds of supports um, did this particular child have, et cetera? And we can start to really put together uh, a, a map, if you will, of what potentially can look like uh, somebody's pattern and really gives us a better sense of, wait, this is not necessarily something that we can you know, send a child to a cognitive behavioral um, work group on how to make friends when, you know, they, they can't stand the lights in the room because they're really having a hard time with sensory integration because of the early trauma. So if we'll go to the next slide. And being aware of our time today and kind of setting us up for our next webinars, which will be more about intervention, well, what we want to do now is, you know, today what we did is we had a chance to really recognize and define what trauma is, what it looks like, uh, how prevalent it is, uh, kind of the legacy and the public health issue around trauma. And now we're looking at, well, on the individual level, how does it start to disrupt normal development? How does it show up in terms of what um, a child might be demonstrating? In some cases, total like emotional dysregulation. Uh, in some cases, sensory integration, because again, maybe the, the part that was developmentally challenged occurred lower on the brain, brain stem. Uh, relational development, again, if, if there's been a lot of trauma and the limbic system is, was a challenge, you can see kids with either you know, reactive attachment disorder, or attachment issues, um, inability to get along, difficulty with emotional self-regulation. And then, of course, uh, cognitive skills, behavioral practice and cognitive reframing are certainly some interventions, but a lot of times we have people really having a hard time with, um, you know, certainly academics and that, okay, maybe this child has a specific learning disorder, they have a reading issue, so, so there can be you know, other things like, say, dyslexia or expressive disorders, struggles with math. But again, a lot of times we can look and start to be really curious about history of trauma and find that some of these academic pieces or behavioral pieces that we often see in school or home environments are occurring because of earlier disruptions. So I just kind of want to put that out there because it's such an important place um, to be and think and that we're going to launch onto our next, um, our next set of webinars, really. Because what we'll start to think about is, um, well, first of all, let me back up. We won't be able to go into, say, like, full mapping in terms of a brain mapping around um, you know trauma sequencing which you can start to get some training around if you are interested um, you may notice an introduction I did some training with a child trauma Academy and this is all based on the neurosequential model of therapeutics and people do go to uh, Cal uh, child trauma Academy and uh, they have online and all kinds of courses for therapists as well as, as educators for interventions and how to actually do some more advanced assessment. But even just kind of thinking, you know, kind of in general being able to re being able to recognize and have this frame, this trauma frame of, you know, not that this is a you know, kid that's really so, you know, dysfunctional. Clearly there can be functioning issues, but being curious again about what happened and what they might need based on is it like a self-soothing issue? Is it more of a relation attachment issue? We need to help, you know, children Got to learn how to be with others, make connections. Are they uh, challenged with sensory integration? A lot of times the self-regulation and sensory integration is about safe, repetitive, um, soothing behaviors. Um, for instance, um, as an example, you know, we think of children doing things like sports all the time, you know, just because we think of it as an enriching activity. 
But for some kids who like are really needing some aspect of say um, sensory integration or you know building some coordination, maybe even some relational things, if we're thinking about team sports, that actually may be a really important type of therapeutic intervention. We don't consider sports and sports teams therapy, but that might be much more useful to a child than a lot of like one-on-one -on -one treatment, for instance. Uh, other types of therapies like, uh, uh, for instance, like pet-assisted therapy. Um, for a kid who has real challenges maybe with, with self-regulation, certainly with self-soothing, even sensory integration or relationships, being able to like brush a pet, to be able to you know care for a pet, to have that kind of interaction and that practice can be a hugely healing in terms of um, you know earlier trauma that's occurred in the brain. So again, this is not meant to be at all an exhaustive list, but it's starting to get us to think about this in terms of next steps and in terms of uh, launching points. And next slide, please. Okay, so I, I told you about this earlier, and I really do want to um, kind of stop for a minute here, these next two slides, because these are really important resources. Um, tip 57, which is a first bullet here, you can download that now, and it's a wonderful resource on trauma-informed care, and gives you a lot of the current best practice. And there's also the CAP key, I don't know if you're familiar with SAMHSA materials, but the CAP key are nice because they're clinician um, like got little cheat sheets and things you can actually bring out in the field with you. Very, very helpful. There's also, we have a great book on workbook for um, women and it's actually a peer support guidebook uh, from the National Center for Trauma-Informed Care. Um, lots of good information there for people who are peer providers, but also I think for any provider interacting um, with the people with trauma, mainly because it's really coming from a peer perspective. And a really important piece of trauma-informed care is really uh, getting the perspective of people who are survivors. Next slide, please. Okay. And then I have all the ACEs um, sites I told you about. And really, even if you just have a minute to check out some of these uh, ACEs websites, I really recommend to ACEs Too High and ACEs Connection. It's just an absolute abundance of uh, research and useful ideas and articles about um, how to work with and understand and think about you know, policy and practices related to adverse childhood experiences. And so given that, I think we are on the final slide. So now we're on the question slide, and we'd love to hear from you, and to the extent that we can. Great, everybody. So um, at this point, we'll be entertaining questions. Um, you can type your question into the box in the control panel, and we would um, we'll um, have address it to Kristen, and we'll be happy to answer your question. So we'll take questions um, on any of the uh, areas we've discussed, or any comments you may have, and feel free to type them into the box, the chat box, and Kelly will then read your question. I also want to add to you that what Kristen was talking is is in the the future webinars we have of this three part series. We'll be talking a little bit more about interventions as it relates to trauma, especially for child welfare workers and also around building resiliency. So those are, will be some areas that we will um, touch on in our, future, in our future webinars. So while we're waiting for um, any questions to come through, just to remind you, we have two upcoming um, webinars. And if you registered for this one, you're automatically registered for the upcoming two webinars in June. And we will be um, uh, sending reminders for those um, also as they get get closer to those dates. So we look forward to having you join us at the future dates. Okay, so we have a question here. Um, regarding trauma, the definition, since the human condition will always have some trauma, people will always get some, do you think that there is a need for some? Kind of like we need some sunlight for vitamin D, but too much, we can get skin cancer. Yeah, it's almost kind of like there's a, maybe an optimal amount of stress in our world. So, um, so that's an interesting idea. Okay. One, one thing that I'd like to you know, say about that is, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that this idea that we would be able to completely eliminate any kind of trauma, it is unrealistic, of course, and that we... Um, you would need to prepare people with skills, and as we always kind of raise children ourselves to be able to be skillful in terms of just dealing with any adverse events. But what I think is so important about the trauma frame 
is that you know we're, we're really trying to come from a prevention approach like yeah life's going to have its challenges it always will and you know even as you know we grow and, and hopefully the world will become a better place what have you new things will come up that are only going to have issues that are going to potentially traumatize people so how can we act skillfully but also how can we prevent things that we know uh, in our communities are unhealthful um, situations and, and relationships and just kind of build more strength in our our larger communities and, and just become uh, better and and reduce the incidence overall. Great. Thank you. Ke Ke Kelly, will you read the next question, sure. please? Um, somebody asked, with the appropriate definition for maltreatment? Appropriate definition for maltreatment. Um, so I'm not, um, like, well, I think I'm not quite sure exactly entirely how to, to answer that. I think um, I mean, clearly there can be more than one than one definition for sure, and I think there can be cultural variations in terms of that. I think what might be helpful in this regard, I mean, again, is to, you can always kind of look through places that are kind of well known in terms of of you know research and help help define some of these ideas. But I can't even explore like kind of what, what the SAMHSA definition is or what have you. But another thing to piece is important is go back and look at that ACE um, in your PowerPoint slide the adverse childhood experiences, because each of those 10, I mean, there's more clearly than those 10, but are good examples of you know, different aspects of, of maltreatment. Great. Next question, okay. Kelly. So if a person has a high ACEs and is in foster care due to that, and the child wants to go back to the environment, what interventions are needed to assist the child stay safe? Yeah, right. Sure. So, so that's an interesting question, right? Because even if people have had like a lot of maltreatment and and have received a number of aces, you know, growing up, I mean, you see people in child welfare because they've had trauma for sure, right? And yet, many people want to go back to their biological families. That's that's kind of the power of attachment, even if it wasn't um, always totally optimal. So there's, you know, what you're doing, so thinking about what you're doing as child welfare workers and think it, um, and all the different types of resources, I think that we can protect, uh, potentially uh, integrate into a system to help the family become more safe is probably the most important piece, right? So there certainly is, um, you know, the individual child, but it's going to be more about that family system and helping them connect with the network to help them get the needs other, if it's individual treatment, family, you know, community supports, uh, practical supports, um, health care, finances, whatever the pieces are, that idea of care management and case management to help stabilize families in the, uh, what we often call like the therapeutic web will be a really important piece. You know, it's not all about that individual therapy. It's often about bolstering and strengthening of family systems. Great. Next question, Kelly. Um, should foster parents be trained to practice self-regulation for themselves to be more effective in training the children? Absolutely, um, and that's actually a, a great intervention that child welfare can potentially provide is not just for the kids and also the biological families and the potential reunification, but foster parents play such an important role uh, in, in terms of the child's development. As providers, we often see kids maybe once if we're lucky a couple times a week, but foster parents see kids all the time, and many of them are you know, really you know, loving, really want to be helpful, they want to be empowered, and they want skills. So as we start talking about this, and I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned this because um, as I do next webinar about interventions, I'll be thinking mindfully about what would be some potential things you could actually teach foster uh, staff, foster parent staff, as well as ourselves, that might be useful to bring in the home environment. Right. Next question. What would be the difference in the brain when trauma is experienced as an adult versus a child? And does it impact health in the same way? Yeah, um, I'm not a, 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 you know, uh, really well-versed researcher on this, but the general idea is that the brain is more vulnerable when it's developing. So as an adult, if I go and I get into a car wreck or what have you, um, first of all, you know, you know, my brain stem, you know, the lower parts of my brain, those have already been developed. Now, you know, in the terms of my um, cerebral cortex, I'm going to have some, you know, obviously some, some impact and maybe develop some anxiety and what have you in terms of, you know, how I'm logically thinking, uh, maybe even on my limbic system, certainly have some reactions. That's actually where more of the anxiety probably lies, for sure. But the idea is, is that I'm better equipped now because I've had other experiences. My brain's been you know, formed you know, uh, earlier in my life. And so it'll be, uh, potentially, I'll be uh, more resilient and able to, um, you know, 
provide a certain amount of kind of self-care and coping that a child, a young child, is just not cognitively at all, the brain structure is not all developed yet to do. So you're actually impacting the formation of the brain, but then also they don't actually have, because the brain's unformed, they don't actually have the skills or the ability, the structural ability to care for themselves um, and, and manage the trauma sufficiently yet. Kristen, the next couple of questions are about the ACEs survey directly. And one is asking, can we collect ACEs in the child's mental health in a child's mental health clinic? And when do we think the time frame would be that the ACEs survey would be used nationally? Okay, that's just an interesting question. So, well, so the ACEs uh, questionnaire, you know, really it was designed for research in a lot of ways. Now that said, I'm sure you know there's a number of people who are using it kind of in research in their clinical settings, finding information and maybe even using it to, to intervene with their their children and, and the people that they see. Um, I would be um, kind of thoughtful um, and careful about using ACEs though be, in terms of a, as a screener um, because it is, I mean, it's, it's pretty intense, as you saw, the questions are pretty intense. Um, and consider potentially some other screening tools for trauma uh, that, that are out there as well. And that's something I'll also talk about in the next webinar. Um, not like the ACEs are bad, but it definitely has been used historically for, for research. So I'm just thinking um, carefully about your options before deciding that. And ACEs, if you go to ACEs Connection, the second question, or ACEs Study, you will get a chance to see all the different ways that people have used ACEs to do some research with um, communities, and it's really remarkable. So in some ways, it is really national, and actually even our uh, you know, legislatures are becoming, uh, state legislatures and, and national legislatures are becoming aware of um, the ACEs as a potential policy uh, you know, tool, if you will. So it's kind of out there. It's happening. Bits and pieces of things often do. Next question. OK. Um. Do we? Do you need specialized training to administer the ACE questionnaire? Oh, that's a good question. Um, no, you do not. Um, and it's online. I mean, people go online and get, you, can, you can actually just look up, even putting in a search box, you know, ACE questionnaire PDF, and it'll pop up. Um, however, that said, I think we need to be careful about again our intentions and really be thinking thoughtfully about how we're using it and, and potentials for you know triggering and and you know, uh, what, what is it that we're trying to do? Uh, but no, you do not have to be. Uh, I would, if I was interested in using it or thinking about it, again, kind of go to the get an idea of how I might want to use it, and certainly consult with folks, um, you know, supervise, you know, your supervisors in your, your work site and um, just your, your larger kind of child welfare community, if you will, just to be thinking about um, kind of the best practice for yourself and your, and your uh, folks that you work with. Good okay. question. Thank you. Yeah, lots of questions about the ACEs. Um, somebody else asked, can ACEs be passed on generationally in terms of outcomes and or reactions to causes of trauma? Well, okay, so there's a, so there's an interesting piece. So the ACEs aren't necessarily really passed on, um, but they are, right? So it's a behavioral piece. These are things that you experience. So if someone has that untreated trauma, I mean, we, we do know, you know, often they might, in fact, um, replicate behavior with their children. So in that case, yeah, because of, of, of modeling and environmental conditions. But there also is a, is a connection. Um, and Dr. Uh, Nadine talked about it in terms of some of the epigenetics potentially. And epigenetics is actually how our, our genes change as a result of trauma, which is a fascinating field, one of which I don't have a lot of authority to really speak upon, but you can actually you know, find um, Child Trauma Academy is a great resource for that as well in terms of you know, how are, how are bodies changing as a result of trauma achievement? It's definitely happening. So in that regard, yes, there, there might be, definitely we're looking at potentially some epigenetic uh, issues as well. Next question. Um, so somebody had asked about a book, I'm not sure if it's called, let's see, The Body Keeps Score, uh -huh. Bessel van der Kolk. Uh -huh. The Body Keeps Score right? by Bessel van der Kolk. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so what are your thoughts regarding his, his work and his book? Yeah, so um, so I've read, I haven't read, I'm going to be honest, I've not read the book cover to cover, although I've read, um, you know, big chunks of it uh, various times. And so, you know, Bessel van der Kolk is definitely considered kind of one of the leaders of, kind of how we understand trauma uh, in, in uh, 
this nation, and probably internationally as well. And what he's talking about in that book kind of very generally in this idea, even in the title about the body keeps score, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different pieces. But again, it's this idea that you know, trauma is, in fact, a, um, a systemic kind of um, impact, has systemic impact, I should say. And that there's a lot of ways in terms of uh, our, our bodies, our physical health, and our emotional and spiritual health that trauma impacts, that it goes kind of above and beyond um, you know, what we might expect emotionally or psychologically. And that this idea of the body is that there's ways of working with the body that can really help um, help mitigate trauma and trauma symptoms. And one thing I just have to think about, just because I know he talks about the book, and I know when I had seen him in public maybe about been a long time ago, 15, 15 years ago, you know, he was talking about some of the early research around, for example, body therapy or, or yoga, for instance, as a potential treatment for trauma because of the way it's you know, connecting with the whole body. And uh, he's a you know, large advocate of some other alternative treatments that are certainly evidence-based, but also deal with kind of the whole person as opposed to um, uh, siloed aspects of the brain. Next question. Okay, how does trauma bond between siblings or parents relate to all of this with kids in care and the idea that the courts want to reunify them. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I entirely understand the, the question. Um, uh, I, I think one, you know, one thing I will say, if I, if I understand this to a certain degree, is that I think I said this a little bit earlier, is that even uh, in situations where there's been you know, a fair amount of trauma and, and maltreatment in families, that uh, often families do want to be reunified and that you know sometimes practices you know, completely practical right to or to kind of help keep people safe can also be re-experienced as really distressing in terms of you know, people being separated and such and so you will get people who are bonded even in, in really adverse situations that often want to be reconnected so I guess what I'm saying for a child welfare worker is that some of these aspects of, of care and, and care for children and rebonding is complex because we both want to keep safety, but we also want to be able to acknowledge and understand and support the, you know, the love and concern that people have for their families. Okay, and one more question on the ACEs. Um, are more or most children being assessed for ACEs at an early age? If not, is there a plan as a whole health care system to do so, to do that, so maltreatment is re reduced yeah. and kids can receive the proper treatment sooner. No, I don't think we're there yet. Um, I think we're still we're still learning a lot about ACEs. And so all of you on this call, it's, great, it's a nice place to end actually, the hundreds of you on this call, you all you know, are in a great leadership position now too of being able to go out and you know, learn more and talk more and have con more conversations about ACEs because we definitely want to see this start to take off. And, and again, if you go to ACEs um, too high, uh, or these other, what you will see entire communities that are just, just trying to become like trauma-informed communities, which is you know profound. And so I think that's how it's going to work, especially in a big country like this, where you know place by place, you know, we'll, we'll keep you know working on ACEs, becoming trauma-informed, doing the research, and really proving how communities are benefiting from having this approach, addressing these types of issues, and then solving the problems further upstream instead of later, you know or I guess further up the pyramid when people are really sick. So we have time for about two more questions. So Kelly, you want to read a okay. question? Um, how do you believe this applies to youth with ASD? And they didn't say what ASD is, so. Yeah, it sounds like probably autism spectrum disorders. Oh. And so, yeah, so um, so I guess maybe the question is, is trauma causing um, you know ASD? And um, I don't think it could, I'm sure there's definitely parts where it could certainly exacerbate ASD and there might be, it might be a part of a diagnostic picture, um, but a trauma itself um, is certainly not necessarily a, a cause in all cases. Um, and then, of course, I think kids with ASD being in the community might be more vulnerable to certain aspects of trauma, to re-traumatization, just because of the nature of, of how they interact in the world. And, you know, they may, you know, be in situations where um, they may not have as much, you know, support or may be more vulnerable than uh, kids without ASD. So it's, you know, it's a good question to ask and to explore further for sure. All right, we're going to take one final question today. Okay. Um, is there any supporting research regarding gender and trauma in terms of sexual identity? even in the area of epigenetics you just discussed? Okay. Um, well, there likely is. I, um, I mean, I, I'm not 
I gotta think I'm, I'm totally familiar. I'm not totally familiar with that. So I would have to do a research piece on that. Um, if you come back next time, um, and ask the same question, um, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to check into that. I'll check into that. Feel free, as you see with our, our webinar here, you have my uh, information. I would love to have a further conversation about that, but I'm afraid I don't, I'm not informed enough to be able to respond to that um, in, in any clear way right now. Okay. Great. So I want to thank you all for really great questions. For those that we weren't able to get to, we will work on getting an email response out to you. Um, I want to thank our presenter, Kristen Dempsey, and for her really terrific uh, presentation today. And remember, we have two upcoming webinars on trauma-informed care that you're already registered for if you're on today's. Um, and just to go to our last slide here, um, we have, um, this is where the, the link where this will be posted along with other resources on uh, continuum of care resources at work at CIBHS. And if you have any questions or comments, you can email us at ccr at cibhs.org. I want to thank you very much for um, your time today. And what, after you exit the webinar, there will be a few questions that you'll get. We hope you'll take some time to complete the survey. And thank you again for your time today.